So without much further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Our guest speaker started out learning entrepreneurship at the College of Charleston. He's progressed to creating his own company. He is a person who he and his wife both met at the College of Charleston, the both College of Charleston graduates. I always find it most fascinating when you finally you bring in College of Charleston graduates who are young, sat there and had some of the same professors, hit some of the same bars, had some of the same experiences as you. So let's give a very warm welcome to Stuart Hardy. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So this is, uh, first off, I'm, I'm excited to be here with you, and this is a great, uh, great lesson in public speaking. Don't ever depend on your PowerPoint. That's the first lesson I'm going to share with you today. Um, so I went to the College of Charleston. I graduated in 2002. I uh, had some experiences with the business school, but my main involvement and my main takeaway from the college was the entrepreneurship courses that I took. And so it's always fascinating for me to come back and continue to get re-engaged and involved with the school. Every time I come back, uh, there's more and more activity going on. There's more being done with the business school and with entrepreneurship. Um, the word entrepreneurship for the school really has evolved over the past 12 years. I, I just sat in on a meeting that, um, that was based solely around the ICAP program, uh, entrepreneurship classes, how to advance entrepreneurship. Uh, and how to have that continuity. So, you know, to Dave and, and his staff have just, uh, have just been incredible with it. Um, so I'm gonna tell you today, I'm gonna tell you the story of my business, how I got started. I'm gonna take it all the way back to the very beginning, which uh, occurred right here at the College of Charleston, and then share with you that whole journey and that story and some things that I've learned along the way. Um, before I do, I always love to understand who's in the room. So I know we've got a mix of, of two classes here today. Uh, who in this room, I didn't see the show of hands. Who in this room, raise your hand if you're a senior if you're a senior in here. Okay, so of those seniors, uh, who in this room has some sort of a business idea or business plan or even job or knows what they're gonna do upon graduation? Yes, sir, tell me your name and, uh, and what that is. I'm Billy Weeks, and uh, me and my friends are trying to make a website for selling concert attire. Attire? Yeah. Concert attire. Like the big concerts that you go to, you have a red shirt and the blue hoops and blue hands. So yep. Awesome. Nice. And will you try to do that out of Charleston? You stay here or, or you'll go? Yeah. Okay. Good luck. Who else? Another senior with something to do upon graduation, yes? Veterinary school. Veterinary school. Nice. Nice. Congratulations. Who else? Can't be just two. Um, going to do some cybersecurity and software development stuff. In town? Here? Uh, I have no idea. Doesn't matter. Here, New York, or Atlanta. Yeah. Good. Cool. Congrats. Who else? Junior in the room. Who's a junior? Any aspiring plans or future plans? Anybody in particular? So the main thing I'll tell you um, is this. You know, we, we got two or three, we got three very different answers there, and I'll share with you that. The most important thing that you're going to do in your journey is, is attending things like this and taking the classes that you're taking because if you look at the two very vastly different roles that we just look at these two guys right here, one's talking about going to long-term school, uh, one's talking about you know, internet base and, and sales right out of the gate, but both will end up being entrepreneurs. And you know the word entrepreneur comes from the French verb entreprende, which means to undertake. So even a vet in his own right is going to have to manage, open a business, operate an environment that deals with cash flow and books and bookkeeping, the same as somebody creating a website and selling wholesale goods. So you know, being cognizant of what the word entrepreneur means is, is really something that you've got to go into business with from the beginning. And all of you are doing that just by being in this classroom today, by undertaking, by doing something different and, and doing something unique. So I uh, congratulate you on that and, and your efforts. Um, so I'm going to take a step back and tell you first, I want to share with you who we are today. So my business today is ASP, which stands for America's Swimming Pool Company. And we are the nation's largest swimming pool maintenance, repair, and renovation franchise. So what we do, literally, we take care of swimming pools. We are the guys that are in your backyard that are cleaning the pools, repairing the pools, draining the pools down, and renovating the swimming pools. Today as a company, we have 75 franchise owners operating 180 franchise territories in 20 states. If I had my 
clicker, I'd show you that in, in, in fancy stats and pictures. But the point is, we've grown uh, from, from zero dollars in revenue. We'll do approximately $29 million in revenue this year and $36 million in revenue next year. We have uh, 325 owners and employees that are in the company nationwide. So that's who we are today. If you look at us as a snapshot today and look at our franchise owners, that's who we are and, and that's what we do. Um, but today what I want to do mo more importantly than, than that is share with you my journey. Um, it, it, it's one which takes me all the way back really to this very room, um, spring 2002. My, really was my first interaction uh, with entrepreneurship in, in the business school. So I grew up in Macon, Georgia, uh, just south of Atlanta. I attended a, a high school there and came to the College of Charleston in 98, graduated in 2002. I you know, really can remember all the way back as, as young as 12 years old, uh, selling baseball cards out of my parents' basement. Uh, by 15, I had a, a car wash business where we were a mobile business and we would go wash the cars, build it back up. By the time I graduated, I uh, had 150 some odd customers and had two employees, sold that business and moved to Charleston. Um, it, it was with that spirit in mind that I knew, okay, as I graduated, as I came close to graduation, three, three and a half years in uh, to school here, I knew that I wanted to start looking for an opportunity. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I certainly was not born with some innate passion for cleaning swimming pools, but I knew that I wanted to find a service-based business to start. Uh, I, so you know, as I approached my senior year, I made contacts and I, I went back home, I talked to people, I talked to people here to try to decide what is it that I want to do, what opportunity could, could be out there that could present itself. And that would really be the first point that I'll, I'll pause throughout these stories and tell you some, some lessons I take away. I, I really, if you look back, I underestimated and certainly underappreciated my contacts that I had. So know your contacts and deploy your contacts constantly. Meaning, stay in touch with them. It's not like you have to put out some monumental effort, but stay in contact with your contacts. And that was all I was doing my, my senior year of college, as I would go or meet people or call back on people I knew, take advantage of those folks you know from your past, because you never know when they're going to end up being your future. And so it's with that in mind that I entered a, a bank, a, a guy was a, a, one of my better car wash customers back in high school, so I called on him and I said, hey, I'm looking to start a business. I have no idea what I want to do, but I want to start a business in some capacity. Do you have any ideas? Is there anything that you've thought of? Can, we, can, I, be your, you know, can I be your young go-to guy that can, that can be there to start a business with you? And he said, yeah, he said, he said, we've got two or three things that we're looking at doing, and we need a young, hungry guy out of school that wants to be our operating partner. He said, one of the things we're looking at is a swimming pool business. He said, we don't know anything about it. Uh, go do some research, explore it, figure out if it's a real viable business or not. And so I did just that. I spent the next couple of weeks market research, uh, developing business pro formas, looking at it. Uh, decided it was something I felt like we could make a go in, in my hometown. Uh, really, why? It really was a fragmented business. And that's, that's another point I'd share with you is if you, if you constantly are looking and, and analyzing different areas, sometimes a business can just either fall in your lap or, or hit you upside the head. So constantly be evaluating services you use, your contacts that you have and services that they use. And that's how we identified the swimming pool business. So I spent the next few months working and going back and forth from Charleston to Macon, developing the business plan, doing all the market research. And we were one week away from forming the LLC. I was going to be their, their one-third equity partner. They were going to be the, the operation guys, the money guys, and I was going to run the business for them. Uh, I was living on Ashley Avenue. Uh, I was taking Tommy Baker's entrepreneurship class. I was in the business school every day. And so I was really part of this, and this was, this was what I was passionate about doing. And told my family I was moving back, I'd rented a place to live, told my friends. And one of the business partners called me and he said, Stuart, I appreciate everything you've done. Thank you for all your hard work. We feel like you're too young, you're too inexperienced. Uh, we're going to go a different direction. So thank you for everything you've done. And as Donald Trump would say, you're fired. And, you know, that was one of those gut-wrenching moments where I, I basically sat down on the floor, took a couple minutes, and I thought, you know, this can't, how can this be, right? This can't be. So if you fast forward 13 years, my company today, who we are today, was started by me being fired. And it was started before, I was fired before we ever cleaned the first swimming pool from that company. So I'll tell you, you never know when a door slammed in your face is actually going to be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. 
So I would take that away today too. Don't let, don't let a door being slammed in your face be the ending to an idea or a task or even a job interview or an application process. <coughs> Because you fast forward 13 years later, you as, a, as an entrepreneur, especially if you're 22, 23, 25 years old, you have no ability to see into the future. None of us do. And so you certainly feel like that adversity is the end of the road. Don't let it be. <coughs> Don't let it be. Entrepreneurism, entrepreneurship, the life of a business owner is going to be constantly filled with doors slammed in your face. And that was the first time I really experienced that at, at 22 years old. So I called my dad that day. I said, Dad, you know, I need to borrow $3,000. Uh, this is just what happened to me. This is, this is how much money I feel like I need to get this business going. Uh, he, he spent you know, an hour on the phone with me trying to talk me out of it, said you're going to be facing this competition and these two business guys in Macon and you don't want to do that and you know, be fearful, be mindful. Uh, and it was great advice, but I decided that I wanted to press forward anyway. Right? I had done all the work. I did all the market research. I did all the homework. I knew the business. I knew I had my own work ethic. But I'll tell you the most powerful thing that I had that, that they did not have and that was motivation, right? And why was I motivated? Well, I had just been kicked in the gut, embarrassed, you know, slammed on the ground, and I felt like if I could pick myself back up and start the business, that, that, that I would be on a path uh, of accelerated growth far greater than theirs. So fast forward a couple months, it's spring, you know, May 2002, some of you are facing it. I graduated, I moved back to Macon, and I started the business. At the time, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, uh, we racked our brains over the course of a week or two trying to figure out what would the name of the business be, what should we call it. Um, the most important thing that we knew at the time in 2002 was that my business had to start with the letter A. Why? Phone book. For those of you that don't know, the phone book is this thing we used to have and you'd, you'd flip it open and there'd be names and numbers in there. In 2002 it was critical. So look how far business technology has come in just that one simple small area. It's funny, as I've, I've told this story for 12 years now, and that's a, one of my favorite pieces to tell, because I want you to keep that in mind. One of the most important decisions that I felt like I could have possibly made in the beginning stages of my company is completely and totally obsolete today. Totally obsolete. Right? We have call tracking numbers in my business and our company today. We know who calls us and where that call came from. Did it come from the web? Did it come from an organic or an inorganic search on the web? Did it come from a direct mail piece or did it come from the phone book? The phone book is so dead that we no longer require our franchise owners to even be listed in it. Yet 12 and a half, 13 years ago, that was one of the most important decisions we spent an entire week figuring out. So remember that business technology and business is going to develop and sometimes it might develop faster than you even realize it and things are going to evolve. So anyway, we named the business All Seasons Pool Company. Of course, when I started the business, I didn't name it America's Swimming Pool Company, right? It was All Seasons Pool Company. That's the A, the S, and the P originally. What did we do? We did then exactly what we do today. We cleaned pools, we repaired pools, and we maintained and renovated pools. Started with just myself in a truck. 2002, I did $72,000 in revenue. Six months in business, I turned a $19,000 profit. I was ecstatic. I knew the business could work. Right, second year we did 300 grand in revenue, significant profit. Next year we doubled revenue again, 600,000. 2005 we did a million two in revenue, we doubled again. So we're on a very fast, accelerated path of growth in the swimming pool service sector in Macon. It was about 2005, I knew, okay, well look, you've got a business, you've got a model, we're doing things a little bit differently than the next guy. We're doing, we're innovating, we're doing some things that most of you in this room would do, very simple business model things, but they didn't exist in the swimming pool business. They didn't exist at all in this industry. And so I knew I can take this thing and grow it. I just had to decide, did I want to self-expand? Did I want to open up my own locations, Atlanta, Warner Robins, Savannah, surrounding cities? That came with some risk, right? That came with, okay, you'd have to put up your own capital, you'd have to deploy resources, I'd have to hire people. It was about that time I had a friend of mine in Charleston and a, and a relative in South Carolina, both at the same time called me, uh, Clemson, South Carolina, and they both said the same thing. They said, Stuart, we hate what we're doing. You're making more money cleaning pools than we are as a banker and as a city manager. How do we do here what you're doing in Macon? And that was really when the F word was brought to my attention, the franchising model. 
Okay, which I thought to me, there's no way. I mean, to me, a franchise is McDonald's, right? Zaxby's, Applebee's, Terminex, these huge national companies. And from my research, I spent the next two or three weeks looking in, into that. And I, and I realized there are over 10,000 franchise companies out there all across the United States. You're dealing with franchise companies every day. But the question I had to wrestle with or reconcile with was why is somebody going to pay me a franchise fee and a royalty and pay me all these things to teach them how to clean swimming pools? Go out and clean swimming pools, right? I didn't need somebody to do that. And a lot of you in this room wouldn't either. But some of you in this room would not do that without a franchise model. Why? The, the best analogy I can give you is this. Um, let's say you've got a, a lifelong goal to go to California. Right, and you're going to drive to California. You and your girlfriend or boyfriend or mom or dad or whoever, you want to go to California. You find me, I can tell you, look, I've been to California 75 times, 180 different ways. I know the best way to get there, the fastest way to get there. I know who's got the best exits, the worst exits. Who's got the cheapest gas, the most expensive gas. And by the way, I've got a little bit of technology that you don't have that's going to help you keep up with your journey map your routes out, all these things. So I've got the technology and I can get you there faster and cheaper. That is what I discovered early on is what franchising is all about. It's that partnership between two entities. An individual that wants to start a business and a company that has a, a well-defined roadmap. And so we started franchising with that in mind. Every decision we made in the beginning was franchisee focused first. It was, okay, what decision can we make today that's going to allow that franchise owner to be better with us than without us? And so if I quantify that, I tell my new owners all the time, this relationship is going to be one plus one equals three. Right? Your, your work ethic, our roadmap, and together we're going to come out better than we would on our own. And so that was the initial premise of franchising, right? A partnership between two entities. So Charleston launched. Clemson, South Carolina launched, 2005. I turn around two or three months later and they're profitable, they're happy, they're working, they're moving forward. By 2007, I had to make a decision. So I had maybe 10 or 12 locations at that point. And I had to decide, kind of at a crossroads, was I gonna be Stuart the pool cleaner in Macon, running a good profitable business? Or were we really gonna take on this beast? Were we really gonna develop a franchise organization that, that could make it? had 10, 12 owners. So I made the decision to sell ASP of Macon, what I originally started, to sell that to an employee of mine, turn that into a, a franchise, take that money, invest it into a real franchise organization, develop models, develop roadmaps, buy a building, get a training center. And so by 2007, that's what we did. At this point, I'd show you a pretty picture of it. Um, we now today, so that was really in 07, was a little tiny, I, I shouldn't call it an office, it was a house, uh, wooded area all around it, run down neighborhood. If you look at that, that would show you the before, now picture the after. So there's 30,000 square feet, we've got 15 swimming pools on this campus, uh, 15 offices, and a 10,000 square foot warehouse that has nothing in it but pumps and filters and motors and things that we operate during pool school. Okay, so our franchise owners come to us and we teach them everything they need to know about the swimming pool business. So I built that campus over the last eight years and today it is the most unique swimming pool compound in the world. Um, we have more square feet, more training swimming pools than anybody has in the world. And so the only way that that has been possible over these last 12 years, really been franchising for eight years, is by constantly innovating and reinvesting back in your business. So one of the most important things you're going to do as a business owner, every time a dollar of profit comes in, you're going to decide, I've got to do two or three things with it when a dollar of profit hits our books. I can either leave it on our books and not collect it. I can either take it on, put it in my pocket, put it in the other pocket and spend it, or I can reinvest it back in the business. Okay, and as a business owner running a profitable business that wants to grow, You've got to mirror all three and watch all three of those components differently because you have to do all three of them. You're not going to collect every dollar that hits your books as profit. You need to take some of it home to spend it, and you also need to reinvest it back in your business. And so that's what we did constantly year over year from 07, 08, 09, 010. By 2010, we had uh, 35 owners. 
Uh, we really were starting to develop a name and a brand. Uh, no, this was 2009. And come to find out, remember the original name of the business, ASP All Seasons Pool Company? Found out that that was federally trademarked in Florida and that name was no longer valid. If you think about the position that put us in at the time, so I had a couple dozen franchise owners out there operating, paying me royalties, operating a business, and I didn't have the federal trademark to the name. So we loved our logo. We had ASP. Uh, we still knew that we needed to be A in the phone book. This is 07, 08, 09. Um, so we, changed, we sat around, my, my business partner and I sat around for a few days and said, okay, we've got to come up with a new name. We're in three or four states. We've got a couple dozen franchise owners. What do we want to be? That was one of the most important things that, that we were faced with early on in franchising is by, by being forced to change our name early on, we had to sit back and think about what do we want to be? Do we want to be the Georgia's leading swimming pool company? No. We want to be the Southeast? No. We want to be America's swimming pool company. And that fit perfectly with the A, the S, and the P. So we changed the name of the business, rebranded. All of our franchise owners rebranded over the next year. And, uh, and that really turned us into to who we are today. It had us refocus. All of our marketing was redone. Uh, we, again, reinvested back in the business. So by 2010, uh, I had another decision to make. I'd tell you this was probably my third really crossroad decision. We were in the franchise business now. I've sold ASP of Macon. The franchise business is really profitable and it's going and it's operating. But I knew that I couldn't do it on my own. I had a couple support staff. Uh, I was faced with an opportunity. My attorney at the time wanted to get into business. He was self-employed, uh, excuse me, wanted to be self-employed. Uh, he was doing a lot of work with us. He hated the legal practice. Uh, and we decided, I decided to sell him an, a minority piece of the franchise company. And so we spent a few weeks and got together. He decided he wanted to come on board. I knew I needed to have a real right-hand man. I needed to have a true VP. I was faced with one of those decisions. Well, it could take all the capital that I have to bring on somebody like that, or I can sell a minority piece of the business. Now, I want to, a lot of you in this room know Tommy Baker, but a lot of you don't. I want to share with you that, what advice he told me. It's one of my favorite quotes. He said, I like big ships and I like small ships, but I don't like partnerships. And he was true, it was true in this sense. Be careful as you go into business, entering a partnership with somebody is like, is like getting married. Right, you rush into it too quickly, you do it for the wrong reasons, it's gonna end poorly. And a partnership is the same exact way. And so I knew that going into it, and my partner and I at the time really spent the time to get our <coughs> partnership right from the beginning. Defining those roles, um, establishing the ground rules, and it, it's without a shadow of a doubt been the best business decision that I've made. Risky, selling a piece of the baby, certainly selling a piece of the baby after selling the original business that was my bread and butter. But it's one of those risks that you can calculate and you can see, okay, well again, partnerships, just like a franchise company, partnerships can end up being the most profitable venture that you do, the most profitable thing that you do. Because again, one plus one can equal three. And so he, we, he and I teamed up. He came on board in 2010. Uh, really the rebirth of the company from there. New branding, new partner, we grew. Uh, by 2011, we added owners. We started seeing double, st same store, double digit sales. So not only were we adding new locations, those were great, but we were seeing our existing franchise owners grow year over year over year. Same store sales increase. It's the most important number that I have in the franchise organization today. Um, fast forward all the way to today. So again, you, you know our campus, you know who we are, you know what we do. We will do $36 million in revenue in 2016. And we've got a four year roadmap, four year plan. By the year 2020, uh, we will have 200 franchise owners operating about 500 franchise territories, and we project $100 million in system-wide revenue. How that's going to happen is, has got to be part of a well-executed plan, right? So know your plan, but also plan early, right? Plan early. A business plan is great, and, and Dr. Wyman will tell you, you've, you've got to have it. You've got to have a business plan, but I'll tell you, sometimes it's about as valuable as the paper it's written on. And sometimes it can get in your way, right? So, so have a plan, stick to it, execute it early, but do not be afraid to deviate from that. Don't let a well-written, well-executed business plan that you got an A on, don't let that be a roadmap that you can't deviate from, right? Learn to adapt, 
adjust, shift, jive, change. And that's what we do as entrepreneurs. So be mindful of that as you, as you enter the business world. Um, that's where we're going. I, I would tell you one of the most interesting things that I can tell you about today, about the business environment today, is really the evolution of the word entrepreneur. And again, all of you that are sitting in this room are either entrepreneurs, want to be entrepreneurs, have parents, friends, family that are, and you've got an interest in entrepreneur. Okay, but entrep to be an entrepreneur, the U.S. has turned that into a verb, right? They're saying, well, I want to go out and, 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 and excuse me, they've turned it into a noun. I want to go out and be an entrepreneur, right? They want, to, they want to say, well, that guy's an entrepreneur, that girl's an entrepreneur, and it's a way to describe somebody. But really, to be an entrepreneur, again, I told you in the beginning, it comes from the word entreprende, to undertake. So you've got to undertake something. And again, I'll end by telling you, the College of Charleston is doing just that today. They are innovating and undertaking something in order to change, in order to innovate and be better and move themselves forward. So know that as you go into the business world, that to be an entrepreneur means to innovate and to undertake and to do something. But again, even if you go out and get a degree and you're a veterinarian, you will end up being an entrepreneur. And you've got to understand that that means constantly innovating. I want to share with you, I'll take a couple minutes and share with you some of the things that I took away from my time here at the College of Charleston, some of my favorite business quotes that I got out of, uh, out of Tommy Baker's class. We had, again, speakers, some of you are in this class still, had speakers that come in each week, give us their business story, tell us their trials and tribulations. You're not going to take away anything more important, in my opinion, from your time at the College of Charleston than, than having this one-on-one -on -one time with these speakers, because you're able to get into a world that you can't go out and buy. You can't go out and sit in a class like this normally. So know that. Take that away from you in each of these classes you're in. And Dr. Wyman's 200 and 400 classes, Tommy Baker's class. Uh, these are things, you know, this paper that this is written on, literally, uh, I was given spring term 2002. Uh, so I have my diploma that I left the business school with, that I left the college with. And I have the notebook from Tommy Baker's class. That's how important it was to me, and I know it is to some of you. And so some of the favorite things that I took away from that, these are quotes that I feel like impacted our business or stuck to our business from the beginning, and they apply today. Find the people that are best at what they do and hire them. Find the people that are best at what they do and hire them. You could associate that with my business story as saying, well, that's why I developed a partnership with this individual, with Tom Swift. I found somebody that was really good at what they did. They understood our business and either hire them or partner with them. Always run your business as a paranoid. This is one of my favorite quotes because at first when you hear this in the beginning, it sounds a little wacky. It sounds like you know, sci-fi business stuff that you're running around and you're constantly checking the pockets of your employees and that's not what this quote actually really means. It means always run your business with a sense of paranoia about who's coming behind you, right? What's your competition doing? What's innovation doing? What's going to be different about business next year than it is this year? So always run your business as a paranoid. And that will leave you with that just enough doubt in your mind to constantly <coughs> be thinking and looking and doing and maybe innovating. Don't misjudge enthusiasm for competence. This applies to my franchise organization today. If there's one thing that I could do to describe uh, the weakest owners in our system or if there's one thing I could change or fix with the snap of a finger, it would be to change incompetency. Um, a rougher way to say that is you can't fix stupid, right? You just can't. I have tried many, many times, and you're not going to do it. So don't misjudge enthusiasm for competence. There is no traffic on the extra mile. I love that one, too. What does that mean? Work ethic. You work harder than the next guy, and the next guy, and the next guy. You all of a sudden are traveling on a road that doesn't have very much traffic around it. Well, then what can you do? Well, you can try, drive faster, drive more efficiently, right? So your work ethic, a lot of the time, no matter what it is you're doing, again, if you're writing software, if you're studying for, 
for medical school, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're operating at a higher level and with more competency and working harder, you're not surrounded by very much competition. And Tommy Baker is my second favorite quote that he said, if you think you're good, you're done. And those of you that know Tommy know what he means by that. You've got to have a healthy, fine line as you're starting your business and as you're building your business. You've got to have a fine line between uh, enthusiasm, competency. You've got to have that little bit of paranoia. So if you think about that quote, that ties it all together for me. As simple as that quote is, if you think you're good, you're done. That's my business story. That's my business journey. That's what's, uh, that's what's gotten me here today. And uh, thank you for your time and your patience. I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. You mentioned at the beginning uh, staying in contact with contacts that you've made. How do you uh, maintain these relationships with former colleagues and stuff that you may not be doing business with? Yeah, good question. Um, so the question is around how do you maintain contact with your contacts? And I think it's simple relationship management, right? I mean, just as you would think of it, you went to high school three or four years ago, you had some good friends you keep up with, you had some friends that you don't keep up with, there's a reason for that, right? So I think you've got to, in your mind, uh, discern as, as your journey goes along the way, okay, who is a good contact? Who, who could provide me something in the future? And that sounds, um, that sounds a little bit egotistical to say, well, who could provide me something? But, I mean, that really is to the heart of, of what the question is, right? How do you decide if you're going to keep in contact with somebody or not that's a, that's a business colleague or a friend? Well, again, look at it selfishly, and I think that's, that's the root of the question. If I needed X, could I get it from Y, from that, from that relationship? So I think it's just simple relationship management and, and deciding what, what relationships are important and, and what aren't. I think, I think you can't go wrong maintaining more relationships than less with people you've come in contact with. And again, you never know, right? You never know who that contact will end up being a, the greatest contact in the world. So. Mark? So uh, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, generosity of your time. And your pocket moving to the school. Uh, Y'all don't know, why, but Sue and I are on the board together for the School of Entrepreneurship. Um, question for you. I'd like to teach students and people are starting out as entrepreneurs that every business in the future, regardless of what they do, is going to be a technology company. Um, swimming pools aren't particularly sexy. Can you tell me what you're doing in your business to, to morph it into more of a technology company? Did Herbert tell you to ask that question? He did not. But it's, uh, so uh, there's a gentleman in the back, Herbert Drayton. Herbert, raise your, raise your hand. Uh, Herbert is, is an entrepreneur, an innovator, a tech guy in Charleston. Uh, some of you know him. He's, he's here as our, our guest today. Uh, he's here because we've gotten to know each other over the past year by doing exactly what Mark asked. And Mark's question is around, and he's basically saying, uh, you go out and, sw and clean swimming pools, how in the world are you going to use technology to make that happen? Uh, Herbert's company, uh, a couple years ago, developed some software for various different businesses that help those businesses keep track of what they're doing. They take lists of a business and checklists, and they make it more efficient and easier for an owner or a manager to keep up with the tasks of what someone is doing. And about a year and a half ago, we knew that, we, we tried, we, there, there's software out there that had been written over the past four or five years in the pool business. We had bought it all. We had tried to find a software that would help a guy that's cleaning pools do it faster and more efficiently, keep up with it better, right? And we could not find anything that satisfied us or our franchise owners. And, and I'll tell you, that kind of gets back to innovation, right? If you're not satisfied with a product you're using, whether it's a restaurant you're walking into or a car tire service or anything, that's where innovation comes from. And so it was with that in mind that we said, you know, enough's enough. We need to find somebody that can help us, we, we can partner with, that, that has the ability to help us solve this problem. We need a few simple things, right? We need a checklist that can tell our pool cleaners exactly what to do. Uh, we've all got camera phones, right? So our pool techs, we need them to take a picture and send that to the customer, right? We need to be able to communicate digitally with the customer, email. Now, all of you in here are going, wait a minute, that this isn't, didn't exist in the pool business? No, not really. If it did, it really wasn't a good product and we didn't like it. And, and so that's where Herbert and I, that's why he's here afterwards we're meeting, um, because we now, he's written a program for our company, we named it Pool Ops, P 
P-O-O-L-O-P-S, and it literally is the digital solution and the digital management of our franchisee's business. So our, our tech, our pool tech that's out there, logs into our system. Miss Jones at 1234 Ashley Avenue, it tells him exactly how to go from A to Z, the fastest way to get there. When he gets there, it clocks him in, it clocks him out. He keeps up with all the chemicals that he added. He hits picture, takes a picture, hits send. It emails the office and it emails the homeowner. Simple stuff. We then can keep track of chemicals more efficiently. So it's improved route time. It's improved chemical treatment in the pool. But more importantly, it's also given a GPS feature to the owner to see how long are his guys going for lunch breaks. Is this guy really clocking in? He's using it for time clock management. So all of these things are, to answer your question, are what we have written into Pool Ops, um, which is now successfully being operated in all of our franchises. And uh, we are going to launch that. Herbert and I are going to launch that to the swimming pool industry as a whole, uh, hopefully by summer next year. Yeah, should be. Should be really big. Yes, sir. Do you think you benefited from jumping into an industry you had no idea about before you started? Yeah, good question. Um, do I think I benefited from jumping into an industry that I really didn't have any clue about. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because I, it's, it's like anything else, right? If you've got somebody that's competent, you know, or hardworking, or good work ethic, whatever, however you want to describe the person, you can't really teach that, right? But I could learn the swimming pool business pretty quickly. So I think what I identified was that the swimming pool industry was fragmented, right? It, it had no uniform service. It had no, at least in my hometown, that's what I looked at in the beginning, right? There was no uniformity. There was no consistency. There was no real brand there. And so any of you in this room could have identified that in two or three days with phone calls and visits to these competition to the competitors and you could say okay well I think I can do that better than the next guy right but I had to learn the business and it was a simple business to learn um, that that was one of the advantages that I had early on yeah um, again like I said in the beginning it's not as if I had a innate lifelong desire to clean swimming pools um, and if you to take that step for, forward if you fast forward take this step further if you fast forward to what I do today and what our company does today we're really, in a way, no longer in the swimming pool business 90 hours out of 100, right? We're in the marketing business. We're in the web and website management business. We're in the technology business. We're in the efficiency business. We'll send out one million pieces of direct mail this year. We'll send out a million three pieces of direct mail next year. So we're in the uh, design and, and direct mail business. Um, good question. Yes, sir. The most difficult part of starting the original, yeah. the original business? Um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think just like anything else, the, the fear of the unknown in the beginning uh, was one of the most difficult things to overcome, but probably also acted as the best motivator, right? I mean, when you get up every day and you're scared out of your mind of, you know, what will I, will I pay the bills that week? Will I, will I make payroll? How will I hire my first employee? Um, who, who can I trust in a, as an advisor? Where do I go to the bank? Who, Who's going to do my taxes? Uh, that was probably the biggest hurdle that I had to overcome in the beginning, was figuring out all of the things that, that don't exist. There is, no, there is no playbook, right, for how to go start up any sort of business. Again, unless you go with a, with a franchise. Here, now I'm back circle plugging the franchise, right? I mean, that's what we do, though. A lot of the things that were the hardest to me in the beginning and, and will be to some of you, you can solve by, by buying the roadmap. Yes, sir. How do you weed out those enthusiastic and competent people? It's a great know. question. If you can figure that out, you let me know because I've yet to figure it out. I mean, they, um, they, uh, yeah, you know, my, my franchise development guy, we always seems every, every couple months we come up with a new, hey, we should profile, we should have psychological tests that you can do. And um, I, I guess I'm just stubborn to the point of thinking that we can, we can weed through it through, um, through a process and we've gotten much, much better at it today. So today, a franchise owner, if they come to us, has to go through an online process, digital step by step, and we keep up with that, right? Did it take Johnny three days just to fill out a simple form? Did he miss these steps? He, so much like a standardized test would tell you somebody's competency, that's what we've tried to develop today. But at the end of the day, you, you cannot, I just don't think that you can identify somebody that is, is such a salesman that they can mask and mirror their inept uh, or, their, or their laziness. Yes, sir. So you talked about 
you and I have a great partnership and you talk about some of the ones that we currently have. Talk a little bit about how you get out of that. Yeah, good question. Um, luckily, uh, Herbert's asking about bad partnerships. Luckily, uh, I've been in more good ones than bad ones, but the advice that I can tell you, if you are going into a partnership, again, I want you to think of it just like a marriage. Because as, as, as valuable as a marriage can be, right, it can be the best thing that ever happened to you, and you've got a partner for life, and you have kids, and you buy a house together. All these things are great and shiny, right? But what's some of the worst things that some of you have been through? Uh, with your parents, some of, the, some of the friends you've had out there, the worst things that can happen to somebody in their life sometimes can be a bad, messy divorce. A partnership ending poorly is the same exact way. Same exact way. And how do you avoid that? It's all about what you do in the beginning by going into it with eyes wide open. Again, the, the analogy with the marriage. You date the person the right way, the right length amount of time. You have somebody look at contracts. You have a partnership agreement. So many of you in this room, and Herbert probably knows this, that's why he's alluding to it, so many of you in this room might be about to make the leap with somebody, and maybe you're developing something with a buddy, and well, all of a sudden that thing takes off and it becomes profitable. Well, you are instantly married, and if you didn't date the right way and have the right documents in place and go about it the right way, you're in a bad partnership. So if, if that happens to you, to answer the question, how do you get out of it, uh, strategically you've got to align yourself. Don't be afraid to hire a good accountant, to hire a lawyer, to make sure that a partnership that's bad ends quickly. One of the things I teach my folks during pool school is this, and it's, it's, uh, it's similar along these lines, is hire slowly and fire quickly. Why is that? It's the same thing with a partnership, entering a bad partnership. Same thing with being in a toxic, terrible marriage, right? Sometimes the best thing to do is get out. Right, same thing with an employee. You will have employees in your business that you hire that are toxic to your environment. So therefore, try not to hire them, right? Hire slowly, but if you get them on board, fire quickly, you've got to, and move on. Some of the most paralyzing things that our franchise owners do is hang on to employees that are just cancerous in their organization. It's absolutely cancerous, so that's a, that's a big one. Yes, ma'am. I don't know that I've ever told my business story without somebody asking that, and I was worried we were getting to the end. So what happened to the, to the two guys? No, so uh, they did not start the, the business. They never could find their perfect partner or whatever it was that they were looking for, and it's interesting to take that story full circle. Um, about 2009, two, no, 2010, I ran into one of the, the two partners, and he basically unloaded on me that he, that he couldn't believe that I screwed him over and stole their business idea and how dare I and that he had always wanted to sue me and um, so you know don't hang on to uh, don't hang on to bitterness in in business because if you do it'll it'll eat at you but it's um, yeah come full circle for those guys I would imagine don't let greed get in the way of of a good partnership in the beginning they had they had a they had a good one lined up yes sir Good question. Sometimes it can. Can, can an uh, enthusiasm um, end up breeding into knowledge, right? Can, can someone overcome it? No, I, I think absolutely. I mean, can, that's like saying, can, can the hardworking kid um, make the, the basketball team? Well, you know, certainly, I think competency and, and work ethic um, all get mixed together, right, to form the perfect businessman and the perfect candidate. And that's not always what any of us are looking for. So sometimes hiring someone with a high level of enthusiasm, a high level of, of work ethic, um, we've got some franchise owners in our system that do great and they are very, very good. And I would never label them uh, as incompetent. I would say that they might not have as much work ethic as the next guy. They might have goals in life that are just, that are just not what everyone else's are. So yeah, I think that um, work ethic can absolutely overcome a, a lot. It really can. Yes, sir. Good, good question. Um, not as much these days as it used to. You know, what, what used to certainly keep me up at night was worrying over uh, finances and financial decisions that we had made that were early on. You know, the, the, the first, probably looking back, one of the hardest decisions I made was in 2003, or the most nerve-wracking decision I made. 
2003. So if you remember my story, uh, I was a year out of college, so I was 23 years old. And I wanted to open a retail store, a pool retail store in Macon. And I had no idea that it was going to come with a, you know, a lease and a five-year term and a personal guarantee. And there was no getting out of it. And um, the night before signing that lease was probably the, the most sleepless, sleeplessness that I've had of knowing I was going to enter something that I, I no longer could control. Um, a five-year lease or, or the 2005, 2006, buying the building um, that we were going to use to house a franchise organization that really had not come to fruition yet. So those sorts of decisions um, early on were, were hard. Okay, unfortunately we've run out of time, but what I'd like to do before we finish off is, as you know, we always like to find out three things we learned here today. So Caroline, what's something we learned here today? Okay, so keep in touch. A common theme on all our speakers is network like crazy. And you know, it's not what you take from a network, it's what you give is what makes it powerful. So think about how you get your network. Sir in the red, I don't know what your name. What's your name? Sage. Sage, cool name. So Sage, what, what have you learned here today? Um, find the people that are the best at what they do and hire them. And what do you think is the best thing that you have to offer a future employer? Um, my IC expertise. I'm a system engineer and that's what I provide. So IT expertise, we know if you have some technical expertise, you will walk out of this college with a very, very good job. So think about how you add to that technical expertise. And from Deutschland, Deutsche, Joanna, what's this? You should start early to make a plan. So if you're going back to Germany at the end of the semester, what's your plan next? <laughs> <laughs> to start making a plan. Right? Okay. That's next. That's a very good plan, okay? So uh, it's a great pleasure to have Stuart here. So let's give a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you all. Good luck.